Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us and welcome to the session Building the Science Technology Innovation Interface in the Ocean Decade, which is taking place in the context of the Virtual Ocean Dialogues 2021, convened by the World Economic Forum's Friends of Ocean Action. My name is Jotika Vamani, and I am the Executive Director of the Schmidt Ocean Institute, and I'm joining you from Los Angeles, where my home is on the ancestral lands of the Chumash tribe of Southern California. And it is my honor to serve as the moderator for today's discussion. But before we get started, I'd just like to share a couple of quick housekeeping points. Uh, first of all, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Ocean Decade website shortly after the end of the session. And secondly, you are invited, all of you as audience members, to participate and contribute by submitting your questions to stimulate and nourish the discussion ahead. Uh, to do this, please use the Q&A function uh, to submit your questions, and you should see that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat should be used for uh, other comments. So this is the third and last session on the Virtual Ocean Dialogues agenda today, focusing on the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. The previous sessions offered the opportunity to explore the potential of the Ocean Decade to support the delivery of information, action and solutions that are needed to achieve the 2030 agenda. And they dove into the issues surrounding ocean data, which are critical to the success of the decade. In this session, we will discuss technology and innovation, which have a crucial role to play in both informing research directions and in moving from science to solutions. Technological innovation that's accessible, relevant and scalable is necessary for achieving the vision of the ocean decade. And if it's leveraged in a timely manner, it will lead to greater impacts at scale. So today's session is about understanding and investigating the drivers, the barriers, the challenges, and the opportunities in stimulating technolo technology and innovation globally. And then discussion on how to increase the uptake of that technology and what the ocean decade can contribute. We have joining us today, eight amazing speakers who will, be in, who will engage in a dialogue framed around three key questions, uh, around investment in technology, barriers and conditions needed for innovation and partnerships, and the convening power of the ocean decade to spur innovation. Very briefly, uh, the speakers will be Justin, Mr. Justin Manley, President-elect of the Marine Technology Society and President of Just Innovation Inc. Ms. Andrea Strakinescu, Head of Unit Maritime Innovation, Marine Knowledge and Investment in the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries at the European Commission. Ms. Stephanie Kanak, co-founder of Ocean Africa Hub and a member of the Thousand Ocean Startups. Dr. Anya Waite is the Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontier Institute in Canada. Dr. Paul Michalak uh, is the Global Director of Technology and Innovation at Fugro. Uh, Dr. David Vaughan is the President of Plant A Million Corals. Ms. Nina Jensen is the CEO of Rev Ocean. And Mr. Maximiliano Bello is the Mission Blue Executive Director and Island Conservation Latin America Manager. Uh, but to launch this discussion, first of all, I would like to turn to Dr. Vladimir Ryabnin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, the coordinating agency for the Ocean Decade, to share his vision of the Ocean Decade ambitions and the role that innovation and technology will play in achieving them. Since the 1980s, Vladimir has been involved in various capacities in the activities of the UN, and has contributed to the core design and coordination of international in initiatives such as the Global Ocean Observing System and the World Climate Research Programme. And so I think he is definitely a man with a global vision. So I'll hand that over to you, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Jotika, for this uh, introduction. You gave me more credit probably than I deserve. But anyway, uh, it was very nice. And I would like to thank you for leading this because I think we had a couple of discussions. It was actually the idea of Jotika that, you know, we really need to focus on technology and innovation. Uh, not that it was a really overlooked, but it didn't have the energy. So we'd like to introduce the energy into this discussion. So as uh, Jotika introduced me, you know, I'm basically a, a 
scientist focusing on, uh, I was focusing on mathematics and, you know, was seagoing scientist. But you know, what we are doing now is a totally different type of science. This is social science. Despite it is called ocean science and uh, ocean sciences involve a lot of social sciences. And we are now uh, on the verge of very important in, uh, innovative uh, social experiment that should ideally take us through the power of science to the ocean that we all want. That ocean is clean, productive, resilient, that uh, uh, on the coast of the ocean and also at sea we are safe. And also uh, this, what I'm describing now are societal outcomes of the decade. And one of the last outcomes is inspiring and engaging ocean. So this is also about us, not only about the ocean. And what is really important is that uh, we need to create an enabling environment in which very clever people uh, uh, will meet you know, the, the financial market in which uh, uh, general public will be involved creating uh, conditions for policy. So so that is a very complicated exercise. And because of that, what we are trying to do now is not only just hard science or chemistry, we are really creating a, a transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary enterprise for the whole world. So one of the most ambitious um, undertakings in the history of ocean activities, I would like to say. So. The vision is that we would like to have a managed ocean and only by managing the ocean that is now subject to so many stresses, we will be able to uh, save the ocean, uh, the ocean health, uh, reverse the decline. You know, technology and innovation can really inform the processes. We need to know what will be the opportunities and capacities of the future. And we don't know that. But at the same time, we need to understand the policy. We need to understand uh, the, the investment environment in which we can just combine the two, um, two, two, two sides, you know, uh, supply and demand. And this is a very uh, uh, interesting exercise in itself. And I would like to uh, welcome everyone. I would like to thank, first of all, the World Economic Forum for providing for us the power of, of their communication, because I already see 180 people on board. So I would like also to thank uh, the previous organizers of the, uh, of the event, the Sea of Trust. Uh, that is about data. And there are two things. We need to create a data environment for the ocean decade and technological environment and uh, uh, technological and innovative environment for, for that. So I would like to, to thank the, the Center for, for Industrial Revolution uh, for conducting the previous meeting, C, C, uh, 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 the Sea of Trust. And now we can in, embark on the, on the discussion of how we can bring together innovation, uh, ingenuity, um, and, and technology together towards creating the conditions for moving towards the ocean uh, we want. So uh, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, really appreciate it. And I would like to thank the Schmidt Ocean Institute for constantly leading that very important part of, of the decade. So this is what I have in mind. And uh, good luck to everyone. I think you need a little bit of it. Thank you, Vladimir. That's a, a very nice uh, introduction that sets the stage for our conversation uh, and puts it into the broader perspective of uh, it's about the ocean, it's also about us and society as well. And uh, so that's really nice. And we're very fortunate, uh, as I said, to have eight amazing experts in the ocean innovation and technology arena uh, that I very briefly introduced earlier. So this conversation is going to be around three main framing questions. And for each of the questions, I will ask two or three colleagues to share their perspectives. And then we'll take some time for the entire panel to explore that question in greater depth and to answer any questions that you have uh, in the audience. So please don't forget to use the Q&A function uh, that's on your webinar screen. So the first question we'll dive right in is, what are the key drivers and incentives to investing in innovation and technology, as well as impact-driven solutions for sustainable development for the ocean? And to, to set the stage for this conversation, I'd like to invite uh, and give uh, three of the panelists, two minutes of opening remarks. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, from Justin Manley, President-elect of Marine Technology Society and President of Just Innovation Inc. So Justin has a broad experience with startups, public corporations, academia, and the public sector. And he's a recognized leader in uncrewed systems, development and operations. 
Uh, he founded Just Innovation Inc. in 2015, where he supports clients with a focus on robotics and ocean technology. So Justin, I'd like to hand it over to you to, for uh, some of the opening remarks. Well, thank you, Jodica. I'm, I'm flattered to, uh, to try to get this conversation going. And I, I think it's very easy to say the immensely positive energy we, we face as we enter the beginning of this ocean decade. Um, the blue economy is big. This is just sort of a, a realization, a truism at this point. We don't have to work to convince anyone about that. But if we put on our, our lenses as either investors or perhaps uh, drivers of impact, ocean impact being healthful, improving impacts on the ocean, the world is not exactly a coral reef with hundreds of feet of clear, crystal clear visibility, right? We, we know blue is big, we know it's out there, but we don't exactly understand everything we need to drive both fruitful financial innovation and positive ocean impact. A few thoughts on that. So if you've spent any time looking at this market, you understand that there is a massive, what we call TAM, total addressable market. Shipping, energy, seafood, defense, tourism, all of these add up to massive financial markets. And so there should be much enthusiasm for investing in innovation and new technologies. Unfortunately, it's a little unclear how to connect that massive aggregate market to actual innovations, business models, and business plans that are likely to succeed. So innovators and investors are often asking the question, who's the actual customer? How does this make money? How does this attract investment? Right? Even though we can intuitively understand it's a big market, we don't often understand the value chain, or, or sometimes we'd say the value proposition for various technologies and ideas. Who buys it? Why? What are they buying? So that is true for the investor side. And I would argue the same questions exist for the impact side. Who decides that it's a positive ocean impact? How do we measure that positive ocean impact? And then if we're successful, how do we connect those answers to the financial side of the equation? So to conclude here, I am very excited. Blue is big. I'm, I'm thrilled to be starting this decade working on these challenges. I have a lot of questions about how to drive it forward successfully, and I hope we, we talk through some of those here on the panel. Thank you, Jodica. Thank you, Justin. That, that was a really nice, uh, interesting points that you made there, not only on trying to understand the investment, but also the impact side of this, uh, and we'll come back to that. Um, for uh, our next uh, speaker here, I would like to invite Ms. Andrea Strachinescu, Head of Unit responsible for Maritime Innovation, Marine Knowledge and Investment at DG Mare at the European Commission. Andrea is responsible for promoting innovative and emerging technologies and solutions and ensuring broad dissemination of marine knowledge and research. And the unit fosters innovation and provides policy input to Horizon Europe, amongst other things. So, Andrea, I'd like to hand this over to you, please. Thank you, Jotika. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, uh, on um, the side, I would say, of European uh, or of European Commission, um, uh, we see this. I would say the drivers uh, like a light, right? I would say framework, framework oriented around regulation. I would say finance and knowledge. We need to provide, I would say, um, a framework that it's relying on the appropriate regulation because this gives the signal to investors. This gives, of course, confidence and also can incentivize new technologies. And there are examples that can be used. As an example, with the single use of plastic directive and with the port reception facility, we, say, we said that who is producing fishing gear uh, can be have to be responsible as well for disposing it. It's not only about the responsibility, but it's also is creating, a, a, I would say, a market for the used gear that gives a signal and gives confidence to the investors. But this is only one example. There are the maritime special plans that already are uh, coming up from the countries saying what they can and they cannot do in terms of activity in specific marine areas. Then to be very brief, it's finance. We know very well that a lot of product uh, ideas, uh, they are not able to move out from the laboratories. 
what we did with the, the level of European Union European Commission with the Blue Invest, we created a pipeline of projects, of innovative ideas, of startups that are uh, in uh, working with us and uh, uh, of course uh, supporting them to bring this into the market. We need of course to coach to improve their entrepreneurial skills for this. We need of course to support them with certification or different grants. And not the last one in terms of importance, knowledge. We need of course to know the ocean. We need uh, uh, to know it because we cannot forecast the future if we don't understand the past. So we need to collect data about the ocean and to be able to access this data. Uh, considering that there are only two minutes, I will stop here and uh, happy to exchange later on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those comments, Andrea. That's a really important point about needing a framework so everyone understands and knows uh, what's where. And I think that ties in a bit with uh, what Justin was saying as well. So that's great. Uh, and for the final introductory comments for this topic, I'd like to invite Stephanie Kanak, who's the co-founder of Ocean Africa Hub and a member of a thousand ocean startups. Uh, Stephanie's one of the driving forces behind Ocean Africa, uh, Ocean Hub Africa and um, Ocean Africa Hub, I'm sorry. Uh, and the first African ocean, which is the first African uh, ocean impact accelerator. It was launched in 2019 uh, based in Cape Town and it aims to accelerate the development and adoption of ocean minded innovations and unleash the power of the African innovators. So Stephanie, uh, I'd like to hand it over to you. Great, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for having me here. I think just to add, um, to answer to uh, what Andrea was uh, saying that I think is very relevant is we see uh, that we need three pillars um, to really change uh, the way we interact with the ocean. The first one being the regulation, the second one being uh, awareness because it's gonna shift consumption and those two are gonna create markets for the third one, uh, which is innovation. And um, innovation really has the power to disrupt at the right scale and at the right pace. So it's very important that it has an enabling environment. And I would say maybe two of the most important drivers um, as we see it um, are the first one to create business cases, um, suggesting that the also realized what you were saying for those innovation, meaning that we need to build startup that can achieve the huge systemic impact but at the same time, combined with a strong financial return, because that's a way to attract private, private capital into, into innovation. And the second driver is the support ecosystem. Um, it needs to play a crucial role. It's structuring itself at the moment. Uh, we see more and more incubators, accelerators, and VC funds uh, that are dedicated to ocean impact. And uh, it's important that they create success stories and that they educate um, also to attract uh, private capital in the end. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so again, I see, um, you know, all, all of you have kind of set the stage of needing more organization, needing to know uh, what uh, investment, you know, what's the benefit for investment, what's the uh, impact uh, and the framework that that sits within uh, to get organized. So. With that, I'd like to now open, you know, to all the panelists. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with a couple of questions and then uh, take questions from the audience. But how do you think that the decade can contribute to this uh, and be a driver and provide incentives to investing in ocean innovation and technology? Any thoughts, anyone? Maybe I can start. Yes. Uh, uh, the very interesting uh, presentation, uh, and I, I just uh, hear the voices, particularly from uh, Andrea right now, uh, about the data. Uh, I have to say that uh, I agree with Justin. There are very strong incentives to invest in ocean economy, and this is both from the economy point of view, from the ocean economy point of view, as much as just the humankind, I think of in terms of oxygen, every, oxygen, uh, every second breath comes from ocean. So it's like we're connected to the huge life support machine, which we know nothing about. But uh, I'm afraid that we, from the technology point of view, from the innovation point of view, we, we accepted that collecting data in this environment is just very difficult. And, and we settled down with accepting that we simply don't have good data and that current technologies allow us only to collect data with some tens, hundreds meters resolution. 
But if we imagine how this transformation could be accelerated, if we do look at the ocean as, as this uh, 3D collection of uh, cubes with one meter resolution, this we could really have this full knowledge of our ocean through full 3D digital twin of oceans, how much better we could uh, uh, model water currents, weather predictions, uh, severe uh, uh, weather anomalies, uh, uh, remediations. These are, these are really, I think, big opportunities. And uh, this is also where I see the decade could assist in uh, building this uh, understanding, maybe even create, stimulate demand for this type of uh, high resolution ocean data or demonstrate, demonstrate demand for high resolution ocean data. That's a, that's a very good point. The part of this is how our mindset needs to change yeah. as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it truly needs to be data fueled in order for the transformation to be accelerated. Great. Yeah. Um, does I anyone can, have? Yes, I can continue on this because uh, it's linked to uh, what was previously mentioned. And uh, I agree that a decade will have the possibility to bring people together and to work on common goals. And one would, could be around the ocean observation. At the level of European Union, we have an initiative in the pipeline working on ocean observation. And we agree that it's really needed that this doesn't stay only at the European level, but of course we are open to engage and to work with uh, uh, all the countries and to be able to cover the oceans, because only like this, we can really ensure that uh, we can protect as we engage some of the oceans, but also can reduce and can monitor uh, and to be able to reduce all the impact that we have on the environment. It's really uh, extremely important that on this, we are all together. So we need, of course, to find what are the objectives around which we are going to work and to engage towards uh, achievement of the common goals. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Vladimir, I think I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jyotika. Uh, indeed. You know, uh, these are all very good thoughts. Uh, but I would like to say uh, that the whole world is now um, be is becoming uh, more science intensive, if I may say so. You know, all the problems that we now face require uh, innovation, technology and science. So the decade is now providing a platform for at least discussing uh, uh, those, those ideas and approaches. So, uh, you know, there is this uh, statement that modern leadership is in partnership. So that's exactly what we are trying to create. We are, we are trying to, to bridge uh, together, uh, supply and demands and, and, and clever people. And and uh, and I think uh, at least first couple of years of the decade will be the years of co-design and co-creation of science and building links. And we hope very much that uh, posing good questions, correct questions, will be able not only to start finding answers to those questions, but also find right people and uh, bring them together. So they will continue the process of co-creating. And that will take us to, to a new era. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, Justin, I see you've got your hand raised. Yes, trying to use the tools to be polite here. Um, you know, one thing that I think is really important, if we're talking about the innovation side of this and technology, one of the things I have sort of come to understand or believe is that our community, the traditional ocean science, ocean technology community really, really needs to open its mind and open its arms and embrace outsiders. Um, some of the most powerful transformations I've seen in the past decade in technology have come from folks who were not from the traditional oceanographic institutions or from the traditional ocean industries. They, they came in and they brought in new ideas and I think one of the most powerful ones is the, the idea of scalability. So a lot of times we have had the opinion that ocean technology is hard, ocean data is expensive. You know, there's never gonna be enough money. Even if all the world nations got together, we still wouldn't have enough ships, right? We have to break that mindset and, and move to an abundance mindset of, we will have abundant ocean data and abundant ocean technology by the end of the ocean, this UN decade. What are we going to do with it? If we can start thinking that way now, we'll actually achieve the vision. 
Thank you, Justin. I'm, I'm uh, seeing some very common threads here emerging. Um, uh, Nina, actually, you've got your hand up. Thank you, uh, Giotica. And just building on what uh, Justin was saying, you know, we will not be able to solve the problems the ocean is facing, which are quite complex and global in nature, without uh, embracing diversity in its full uh, form. You know, we really need to listen to not just ocean experts, but to uh, a very diverse group of people and organizations different geographies, backgrounds, thinking to be able to solve this problem. And I also think uh, that the, the UN decade provides the exact framework for that, for bringing together a very diverse group of people from all over the world to solve these complex problems. And I really hope that we will all be grabbing that opportunity and that we will also be able to some extent to put our I like to call it pet projects aside, uh, and that rather than focusing on what is important for me or for my organization, that we look at the greater good and that we can actually unite behind some really big goals uh, that we can all achieve together. Because there may be other organizations or institutions or companies that are much better suited at solving the problems than you are. And by actually helping them succeed, uh, we may all uh, win in the end. Thank you, Nina. I'm actually going to, um, we only have a few minutes left for this, so I'm actually going to ask, uh, take a question from the audience, uh, just to uh, keep the conversation going here. But um, so there's a question here from um, Giles Becerro, um, which says, I think that the scope of the return on investment condition needs to be qu clarified. It's not only a matter of monetary flow. And this Kind of touches on, um, I think, some of the earlier opening remarks of um, defining investment and what there is for investors and what does it mean to be impact uh, driven. So would any of the uh, panel members like to take that on? Powell. Uh, yes, a very interesting point, and I think it uh, ties very nicely to what uh, you said before, uh, Justin. Uh, and I see similarities between ocean industry and space industry. So uh, looking what evolution space industry went through uh, back uh, five, 10 years ago, this, this were larger organizations uh, lobbying for space ex explorations, more, more at the government level. And then suddenly at some point, uh, it became uh, commercially viable to explore space. And suddenly this flywheel effect happened. And, 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 and suddenly we, we started having an abundance of startups, different organizations, uh, the, the whole ecosystems became very, very vibrant. And that's when I say that ocean exploration should also get more into becoming a, a business. I, I don't mean to derive profit for this, but I mean to self-fund the journey such that this flywheel effect happens again, similarly to what uh, happens in the space industry uh, recently. It's a good point there, Paul, uh, connect, making that analogy. Andrea, you uh, please. Yes, very shortly, I think that, um, and probably uh, if we want to achieve the objectives that we proposed in terms of climate, investors should not only look at the return on investment, but should look also of the sustainability of their investments. And we know uh, that in terms of public money at the level of European Union, uh, with the taxonomy, uh, we moved in this these two direction. It states nevertheless that the private funding should, should uh, uh, orient themselves. And uh, probably here, there is also a place for, uh, I would say for the public, but also for the shareholders, to, uh, to convince the private uh, companies to move into direction of the sustainability. We know very well the return of investment is the first one, but I think for the sustainability of our life on earth, we need more than this. Very good point, yeah. Um, so Stephanie, I'll let you have the last word on this section and then yeah. we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, those are very important points. You need to combine both, I guess. I mean, there are different kinds of investment. You can go for grant investment and then you can go for private investment. Uh, but the more capital, the better. So in order to attract also the, the private investment, I think the return, the financial return on investment is good. It's going to fuel back into the research, which is a great thing. But we definitely need to strengthen our impact assessment uh, capabilities. 
Uh, there are only a few firms that are really dedicated to ocean and that have that expertise. Um, and, you know, we need to educate on impact assessment. We need to make sure that we measure it right. Uh, it's su such a complex ecosystem that, you know, you're never sure of the end uh, impact. But uh, this is something that the Ocean Decan can, I, I think, bring to, bring to the table as well. Um, and that's very needed. And that's been in the discussions of every incubator, accelerator, VC fund I've, I've been working with. So um, um, this, I think, is, is a good, uh, good, yeah good thing that we could work on together. That's a very good uh, piece to end this uh, section of the conversation on for now um, and uh, uh, on how the Ocean Decade can help both in educating uh, uh, impact investment and um, measuring that. So, and I see the questions are rolling in from the audience. So I'm gonna move on, but try and weave in some of those questions uh, later in the, in the conversation. Uh, so the next um, framing question we're going to discuss is what are the barriers and necessary conditions to support and accelerate the uptake of innovation and technology uh, in various operations and businesses? And so actually, I'd like to uh, get the ball rolling for this portion of the discussion uh, by inviting Dr. Anya Waite, CEO of Ocean Frontiers Institute and Associate Vice President of Research for Oceans at Dalhousie University. Anya is also the co-chair of the Global Ocean Observing System Steering Committee and the first woman at the head of this body since its creation in 2011. And she also sits on the boards of Canada's Ocean Supercluster and the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network. So Anya, I will hand the floor to you. Thanks very much, Jodica. And how interesting this has been um, so far, so fabulous discussion. I've been taking notes frantically to make sure that I'm sort of absorbing your wisdom as we go forward. Um, okay, now I've just lost my screen. Hopefully you haven't lost me. Um, so I have a couple of just two things, one big thing and one little thing to say, and I'm going to say the, the little thing first. First of all, as, as most of us know who are working in academe and ocean technology um, and ocean research, there's a real gap or maybe a canyon perhaps between research and innovation on the one side where the brains are working to come up with the great, great new ideas and commercialization. And a great colleague of mine, Stephen Hartland, once said, universities don't commercialize, businesses commercialize. Uh, perhaps we could better say academe doesn't commercialize, the business and industry community does. And so we need to bring academe into the business conversation and businesses into the academic discussion. And this is hard to do because effectively academics think of uh, business people as, as, as old guys hunched over their laptops doing their, doing their uh, economic assessment. And um, businesses think of slow academics with their back to the window and their face to the books. Um, and so there's a, there's a cultural divide there that can often be a barrier. Things like um, organizations like the Creative Destruction Lab Ocean Stream, which Justin is also involved in, have been transformative there, bringing academics into the real excitement of ocean innovation and, and ocean um, industries and vice versa, bringing um, businesses to really the, the coal face of the research and realizing how research is critical to get the innovation right. So it's that dialogue. Um, so other than just asking academics to look up or helping them to look up, um, th that's a critical part. That's a, that's a small part, I would say, of the whole, of the whole um, challenge. The biggest challenge for me in this whole area is really that ocean observation and the technologies that it's based on need to shift their focus. And I think it was Vladimir in, in a meeting a few months ago who said, we need to move from diagnostic uh, discussion to a solution focus. And my view here is that, and it builds a little bit on what Jodica and, and Nina and a few others have said, um, we need to become mission-based. We need to think about what are the grand challenges, the policy grand challenges, the human grand challenges, and focus around those. And I'm gonna give you a specific example. So the American Meteorological Society recently identified that the demands for improved forecasts are skyrocketing with the number of extreme events under climate change. And there are systematic errors in prediction of droughts through unexpected, what they call atmospheric river events. Sounds localized, sounds focused on the meteorological community. However, much of the US winter rainfall critical for agriculture is that now becomes unpredictable because that atmospheric river can't be mapped and can't be predicted. Why? It's due to this unpredicted variation coming from the lack of ocean data, lack of 
temperature data from the key oceans that drive the changes in the atmospheric river. So they have this institution then um, defined precipitation as the atmospheric prediction grand challenge for which we need global temperature data to be at the right place at the right time. Where exactly are the gaps? What needs to be delivered? A critical piece. I think ocean carbon is another piece, which we're currently having um, strong discussions about in Canada and ocean biodiversity as well. But if you can define it as a grand challenge that we need to solve for policymakers and for the scientific community, then it's much easier for us to join forces and focus our energy. And I think, you know, to really become solution focused, we need to become mission based and not mission based in terms of doing something down the block, mission based in terms of the moonshot, um, getting the big questions solved through ocean observation, which in itself will lift the need for connectivity between um, innovation and technology. So I think it's, it's, it's getting it big enough and tight enough and clear enough that we can engage the whole global community. Thank you, Anya. That's uh, two very important points, actually, I would say one is the, the cultural divide and the other is that solution based mission focus. Um, so I'd like to next turn the stage over to Dr. Powell Miakalek, Global Director of Technology and Innovation at Fugro. Powell is responsible for Fugro's digital transformation and leads, to, uh, leads a global community of engineers and digital technology leaders to shape Fugro's integrated digital solutions. Uh, previously, he's worked in strategic technology and business development positions in Europe, the Middle East, the US and Australia. So, Paul, over to you. Yeah, and the difficult name is a part of my branding. Apologies yeah. for that. No, no, no. <laughs> from from one who has one. Part of the branding. <laughs> Uh, so before I, I talk about challenges, I, I would uh, just like to challenge actually ourselves that there are actually any real uh, barriers and, uh, and bottlenecks. And what I'd like to bring uh, right now is, is the situation that a year ago we could probably name 10 different challenges and then this rapid digitalization of 2020 proved that uh, where remote working is not actually a challenge, it's been just a perceived challenge. Um, autonomous, autonomous vessels collecting data uh, in the middle of the ocean also didn't happen to be a challenge. It was just a perceived challenge uh, and a high bandwidth uh, tra data transmission from, from meta ocean buoys, also easy. The, the rapid uh, rise of offshore wind industry uh, in the last year uh, generated a similar effect. We realized that uh, we previously thought that uh, investing into a large scale marine infrastructure must take ages and be difficult. It doesn't seem to be difficult. We can, we can build large uh, wind farms in, in single years. The, the legislation uh, follows up doesn't need to be long as well. So uh, I think that if we just force ourselves to think about uh, more creatively, we see that the challenges are actually really something which we just impose on ourselves. But if I would force myself to name a challenge, I would actually like to echo what uh, Anya just uh, said, which I really liked uh, your comments about uh, defining these grand, grand challenges, the, the, the missions, I, I think is uh, exactly spot on. And this is, uh, I'm actually not worried about the uh, two, three plus years future, because then uh, uh, we already see that the industry changes so much, we'll see the um, demand for data, uh, we'll see how much the, the economy can be accelerated. And, and at that point, we'll already be at the stage that it will be much more self-funding than it is today. But in this next two, three years, I see that uh, the, this better definition of uh, grand challenges, missions, uh, even if I could uh, call it from more from the project management uh, uh, angle, this use cases, uh, this will very much help to, to drive demand and show and demonstrate the demand for, for ocean data, for uh, uh, ocean economy, how better ocean data influence weather predictions, this type of use cases, which could then uh, be used to generate business cases to then uh, invest and fight partners. So from, from our perspective, uh, we in Fugro simply deeply believe in the cost. So regardless if there is a business case or not, we, we invest in this because we know that that's what we need to do. But because these major game changers require investments of uh, 
many tens of millions. Uh, uh, today, the only solution is to really just make sure we we find partners in this in this journey, uh, uh, and these partners are required to to bridge this uh, uh, two three years short term future. So, if I would name one challenge, it's uh, bridging where we are now with this two three plus years future. And what would be helpful here is uh, maybe indeed even decade assistance in the much better definition of this uh, use case is the grant challenges missions uh, where the biggest uh, game changes could be so we can work with our partners to focus on these particular areas. That's great. Thank you, Paul. I'm hearing a strong call for uh, defining missions uh, from, from our panelists here. Um, and so the final person to set the stage for this is uh, Dr. David Vaughan, president of Plant a Million Corals, uh, a voice also from the Uplink community and a grantee of the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners um, to share a couple of minutes of his thoughts. And uh, David discovered the technique of coral microfragmentation in 2006 and started Plant a Million Corals in 2018. Before this, he was the executive director of the Tropical Research Laboratory and the director of the Center for Coral Reef Research at the Moat Marine Lab Laboratory in Florida Keys. So David, uh, please, uh, uh, I uh, hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, I think a number of the points already taken up were very prevalent here in that the, uh, you know, the, the things that are stopping innovation right now is, is not the development of technology, it's the implementation of technology, the transfer of technology, the training, the ability to fund it. And for instance, in, in, in the corals, uh, it, it was the same question that Justin mentioned, that who is a customer and who's going to buy it? There's not a commercial uh, plan for putting corals back into the ocean. There's no seafood market, there's no transport market, but there is possibly a, uh, an attraction, an education and a resort uh, type, of, type of market. Everybody thought it was too hard and too expensive and too slow to grow corals. It's now a game changer. With microfragmentation, we cut a coral into hundreds of tiny pieces, not only to produce hundreds of corals, but we also uh, actually have the ability to uh, the the ability to have them grow 25 times faster. Plant all the genetic pieces, similar pieces near each other, and when they grow and touch each other, they refuse back to a coral head that would have taken 25 to 100 years, and we can do it in two to three years. So we have the technology right now to get to scale, but what we need is that transfer and training. The R&D has to go to the people in the field. We need capital funding in the form of equipment and supplies. Uh, we've now developed a unique uh, innovative idea in that we build and engineer a, the technology of a coral land nursery and put it in a shipping container to ship it. And the continued funding is very important. And we find that these land-based nurseries uh, are an attraction by the public and could be a way of sustaining operational funds. And finally, permits. This is so unique that permits uh, could be the one that takes longer than the technology to be developed. But this is a game changer for corals. And I'm glad to see that this now can be real to get to scale. Thank you, David. And uh, again, some really great points in there, uh, some of the barriers, um, but also um, a, a good point that you made there was that everyone thought it was too expensive and then there's a new technique or an innovation or a technology comes along and it becomes a game changer and changes people's mindsets, which is what, uh, you know, that uh, uh, Powell and I think Justin also were talking about. So uh, questions are rolling in. Um, so a, a particular question, I mean, David, you started this uh, uh, as well as uh, Powell and Anya, but what, what, this is for the whole panel, what other barriers can the decade help to overcome? Do, do you have any further thoughts on that? Yeah, David, yes. I think the biggest barrier is, is still funding, that the implementation is needed because there's not a business plan. 
And the way we thought this could move forward was maybe some of these larger foundations that could be able to implement, not just putting to a general cause, but be able to implement some of these, like some of the programs taking place now, Uplink and, and Earthshot, and some of those are, are, are very good to be able to, uh, to fund this. So I think that's one of the biggest things of being innovative in it. I think it's not just the equipment uh, that needs to be donated to specifically islands that may be second and third world countries, uh, but a way for that country to continue to operate. And I think, uh, you know, resorts and uh, recreational is, is the way to go. In Florida, it's a $5 billion industry, 70,000 jobs in Florida for, related to the reef. And so if we can use some of that money, if the reef was a corporation, it would be reinvesting a certain percent of the value of that product uh, into keeping it going. We need to reinvest as a, as a country, and if not, then at least as uh, philanthropic foundations. Thank you, David. So I'm gonna take um, money out of the equation for now, and uh, let's see what other barriers there are. But Anya, I see you've raised your hand, so maybe uh, I'll let you answer. Following on from David's point, which I think is a very valid one, I think one of the, the, the barrier there is actually to crystallize and carve the work into fundable units, because we can't fund everything. And the danger of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is that the discussion is so broad that we are doing a tiny bit on a whole lot of fronts. And I think what we have the opportunity to do in the UN Decade is to say, okay, what are the three or four big things we're gonna do? And how do we define those so clearly that they, it is self-evident that they must be supported going forward? And that is a lot of intellectual work. That doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a lot of deep thought um, and it takes discussions like this one to tighten up the conversation going forward. Thank you. That's uh, also good, a very good point that uh, Anya, you just made there. Justin? So I alluded earlier to thought processes and, and how people think. And I would, I would summarize a huge barrier as uh, imagination and talent. So there's a lot of talent. Uh, Anya did a great job of the commercialization versus academic research discussion, right? Two immense talent pools. Sometimes there's a failure of imagination to connect those talent pools. And then to be honest, this community is lacking in a talent pipeline um, of both younger professionals or professionals coming from other fields, bringing fresh ideas diverse viewpoints, right? We have a tremendous challenge in front of this global ocean technology and innovation community, increasing our talent pool and talent pipeline so that the best minds are working on these problems. You know, we're competing against the space exploration industry that Powell alluded to. We're competing against Silicon Valley companies that, that make software as a service products that are very exciting and mint, mint billionaires very quickly. We, we really need that kind of talent on board. Um, the good news is I see it and I see enthusiasm out there, but we could do a better job of cultivating the talent and the connectivity and the imagination. Uh, great. Um, actually, I'm just going to weave into this conversation a question from the audience that's of uh, some relevance here as well, which is around uh, changing the pipeline and, and building uh, diversity. Uh, and this is from Philippe Fleury. What would you consider the role of traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge in bringing, into bringing ocean innovation about? And how does the decade plan to perhaps articulate uh, traditional ecological knowledge? So I think that weaves in, and I know, Paul, you had your hand raised just before I uh, interceded there, but... Uh, so I'll let you go first, and if the uh, panelists have other thoughts. Uh, yeah, I can take uh, both. Uh, so first, with this uh, particular questions, um, again, I would like to make an analogy uh, to this um, uh, tradi traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, one of the most important roles these days are data scientists, and, and data scientists are on the rise. Where you know, back in when I studied, uh, we called these people mathematicians, and uh, and the, and and maybe this also is uh, something which we could here refer to as a traditional ecologist. I think there's 
we, without mathematicians, we would never get to data science without uh, deep uh, expertise in what we refer to as traditional ecology. We would never get to the new reality of uh, ocean science where we really get into this uh, decade outcomes described by uh, productive, uh, predictive, uh, healthy, safe ocean. And uh, this, uh, maybe it's not even the step which uh, is real, it's a really a perception uh, step as happened between mathematicians and data scientists. It's, it's actually the same. It's just we started perceiving this role as much more important, therefore it, it sort of got a new name. Uh, so I absolutely think that uh, this is uh, as required in the future and has been required in the past. And the reason why I had my rank, rank, rank hand uh, raised before was just to make a comment to what uh, Justin said. Again, comparing to the space industry, what attracts talent to space industry is the fact that it's, it, it's been made exciting. So people would like to make a huge impact. People, particularly in, in this uh, millennial era, era would just to join, I don't want to say the hype, but join the hype, ride the wave. And when I look at, at our ocean effort, is to be honest, one of the most exciting things I have ever witnessed in my life. I mean, really look look at what we exploration we can uh, 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 initiate, what, what, what answers to questions we haven't even asked we may find there. It's extremely exciting, but not many people talk about options in this way. And I think that this is why the, there is this perception that it's, it's less attractive um, as a, as a talent development area. That's a very good point, need for that inspiration. Yeah. Uh, David, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, I just wanna recognize a wonderful program out of Japan, uh, which was basically uh, called ILEC, and it stood for Involving Local Environmental Knowledge. And time after time in studies for natural resource restoration, they proved that if you don't include the local environmental knowledge and have full buy-in by the community, there hasn't been one restoration project around the world that was ever successful without that. Thank you. Thanks for highlighting. Uh, it sounds like a successful uh, uh, integration there of the local knowledge. Brilliant. Vladimir. Thank you very much, Jyotika. You know, I have to apologize because I'm going to come back a little bit to the to the money issue. You know, uh, um, you know, what comes to my mind is uh, the need to to get money for for the good cause. And uh, a fantastic example is the Green Climate Fund, that is supposed to be was supposed to be uh, filled with uh, 100 billion US dollars to help uh, the world to adapt to climate change and uh, and, and and to help uh, developing countries at the moment uh, the the fund is filled at, uh, at the level of 8% so you know it is very difficult to find uh, resources for common good you know we can use philanthropic foundations but in principle the the private market is measured in by trillions of us dollars equivalent and the common good uh, is you know I would say hun uh, uh, with several orders of magnitude less than that. So what is the decade is doing? We would like to mainstream good causes. Ocean is very um, perspective in this case because you know many people resonate with this and we can help the ocean and ocean will help us to mainstream uh, uh, good causes and the, the role of science in the society. So I think this is what is happening. And uh, uh, um, but the manifestations of that big philosophical approach will be uh, uh, found in different ways, of course. Thank you. That's that's great to hear. Is uh, uh, looking at mainstreaming those good causes through the ocean decade. Uh, Nina, you have your hand raised. Thank you. And just building on what uh, Vladimir was just saying. Uh, I think there is uh, money and funding out there, but the current problem is that the funding isn't finding the good projects and the good projects aren't finding the funding. And I think uh, the UN decade uh, could be a perfect vehicle for matchmaking uh, in those arenas. So if we were better at 
within the seven goals or ambitions that you've set uh, so uh, succinct for the decade, if we were able to highlight the different uh, organizations or companies, technologies and innovations that exist uh, around the world that can deliver on those specific targets and maybe unite around a few of these that could be game changers, then it would be easier for the investors to go specifically into something uh, that they see as, well, maybe more targeted. You know, if we keep asking for money for a big blue box, then I don't think that uh, investors and funders are so uh, naturally inclined to put money into it. But if it goes to something very specific that more of us are uniting behind, uh, it may resonate better and we'll be able to uh, achieve more funding. Absolutely. Um, that's a really good, uh, uh, very succinct way of, of suggesting uh, the matchmaking skills. So Justin, I'm gonna have, let you have the last word on this and then move on to the final question. Thanks, just real quick, totally to uh, riff on what Nina said. One of the things I'm observing is that there's a lot of regionalization in this blue economy. And so what ends up happening is all of the ocean tech companies in one region end up connecting, but they may be doing a hundred different things. And if the ocean decade can help us connect those hundred different things to all the other regions where there's another hundred startups doing, this comes to the thousand startups idea, right? There are 100 groups of 10 startups working on the same thing, but they're not in the same place. If we can change our regional focus to a global focus of communication and connectivity, I think it'll really help. Great, thank you, Justin. So I'm gonna move on to the final uh, framing question for this uh, conversation. And that, are, and, and a lot of this conversation leads into this beautifully. Um, what opportunities can arise from partnerships in innovation and technology? And what's the convening uh, framework and what opportunities can arise from that that the Ocean Decade can offer? Uh, so I'm gonna start um, for this. We have uh, two panelists here to help set the stage uh, for this conversation. Um, and I'm gonna start with uh, Ms. Nina Jensen, who's the CEO of Rev Ocean. Uh, Nina started as CEO with Revotion in 2018 after 12 years of positive impact in the world in the WWF in Norway as Secretary General since 2012. Uh, and she's active in the global community. She sits on a number of boards of directors and advisory boards and high level panels to which she brings her commitment and passion for the ocean conservation and, and sustainable solutions. So Nina, if you have uh, some opening couple of remarks on um, uh, partnerships uh, in spurring innovation in technology, that would be great. I sure do, uh, Giotikan. Thank you for that kind uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And as we've uh, been discussing uh, in, the, in the previous sections, uh, the world really needs a, a large scale campaign uh, to deliver the solutions the ocean so desperately needs. And it needs uh, advances in collaboration and in innovation and in technology, but it also needs to make good use of the data and technology that already exists. Uh, and that's exactly what the UN decade, um, the ocean decade will hopefully facilitate and uh, deliver. I think critical uh, to achieve um, their ambitions, uh, but also in solving the complex problems that the ocean is facing, it does require uh, a diversity of thinking, of background, of skill sets and geographies. And actually uh, by bringing uh, these diverse people and groups and organizations together, I think the UN decade uh, is the perfect vehicle for coming up with the new uh, solutions uh, to problems that still remain unsolved, whether it's uh, the plastic problem, uh, climate change or overfishing to name a few. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we will not be able to solve any of these problems unless we also make good use of the data and technology that already uh, exists. We keep searching for new data and new technologies, but by actually um, collaborating and getting together and uniting behind a few bigger goals, uh, I think we have a much bigger chance of succeeding and we'll also be able to raise more funds that are desperately needed uh, to 
um, creating one healthy ocean. So I hope if there's one thing that can come out of this session, it's for all of us to actually be able to put our differences aside, collaborate, team up, and really make a big splash for the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, for uh, those excellent thoughts um, on utilizing what already exists uh, in bringing in new players into this arena. Um, the next, uh, and then last but not least, for some of these opening comments, I'd like to invite Maximiliano Bello. Uh, he's the UNFCCC COP26 Ocean Champion, a Mission Blue Executive Advisor, and Island Conservation Latin America Manager. Uh, Max is an international ocean policy expert who has worked in the environment arena for over two decades to advance marine conservation priorities. And he's worked for non-governmental organizations in Chile as, and the US, as well as with the UN and governments in Latin America and around the world in order to establish marine protected areas and other conservation measures. So Max, uh, if you have some opening thoughts uh, and remarks on partnerships in uh, innovation and technology and the convening framework of the ocean decade, that would Thank be wonderful. You. Thank you, yet again. Um, and it's a pleasure also uh, to be in this panel with Nina and with um, incredible uh, people uh, working on this every day. I really appreciate this uh, to, to have the opportunity to give a little bit of perspective also on how partnerships, I think it's important to understand the enablers also of partnerships. I think it is, um, we're still, we have big gaps on how we use that information, who will use this information, how to provide that information. Um, I've been working in, in the region for, for a few years. I, I've seen the difficulties of actually sharing information itself, for example, from um, uh, regional fisheries organizations that have uh, important information about fisheries that are basically um, not shared with other groups in the region to take the right decisions. And so, so how we improve the sharing also between different groups that might have different views about what to do with that information. So some of them will use it for uh, uh, you know, extracting or for industrial purpose, but then how do we actually, for the, we use it also for conservation and how we bring these two views finally together. I think it is extremely important. They're not one and the other. And, and you know, in, in, in Latin America and the East, uh, uh, Tropical Pacific, for example, there's a group, of, an incredible group of people working there uh, called Migramar. They're, they're a group of different scientists who are working in each of these countries from the US actually down to Chile. And each of them have created a partnership to, to, and, and a collective to bring together all the information about migratory species. But they have little resources to actually, you know, continue doing their work while we have, you know, still, as, as Nina was saying before, some gaps on how to actually support those groups to get the money or how they can find those people who are actually putting these resources. I think partnership goes hand to hand to those resources, to the interests of everyone in the long term and the interests of different views about how or what we're going to do with the, with the ocean. I think those, those things are, are critical. I think there is a lot in, in many of these regions in the world, particularly in Latin America or the developing world, if you want to call it, there is a, a lot that have to do with governance too. Uh, so creating all the structure that is needed to actually use that information in order to take the right decisions for the long-term uh, use of the resources of, or protection of those resources are, are going to be the kind of like table to start talking about those partnerships in the future, in the long term, and, and for the good of everyone. Um, that would be a little bit of uh, my ideas, Jenica. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, uh, uh, thank you both, Nina and Max, for those comments. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of, um, uh, you know, again, breaking down barriers in a different way, developing partnerships and sharing of information. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a third panelist, unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us, but uh, in conversations with her, she also brought up the idea of learning from other decades. So, you know, the decade of ocean science is not the only, uh, is not the first, it's not the only one. And uh, so perhaps we have uh, lessons we can learn 
in breaking down some of these barriers in uh, as they have applied to other decades. And I just wanted to add that into this conversation. So um, with that, um, do, do we have, uh, do, do any of you have examples where uh, capacity building, uh, and you've, you just gave a, a, a one there, I think Max as well, but where it's, um, but, but how it um, relates to equitable access to technology. Uh, uh, do, are there other examples that have really worked, especially through large scale frameworks or global initiatives? Um, so if I can go first, uh, yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're good, um, interesting um, focus on, for example, like uh, in, in Chile, we have a, a particular funding that comes actually from the revenues and from the licenses of, uh, of uh, fisheries uh, that happen in many, in many countries, and that is invested in a much kind of a larger uh, scale sort of uh, programs to understand not just those fisheries, but actually the ocean itself. And then that have been also providing the, the resources to uh, buy, you know, vessels that are shared between different scientists in the country and even external too. I think those examples of, of how we actually can use the same resources for the for the good and 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 on one of the things that connect with the, the the previous conversation too is how we use science. We, we sometimes we focus in on the science uh, of the things that we need right now in the moment, but how we actually focus on a kind of uh, a leverage of that inf the information that we need that might not be relevant by now, but it could be relevant for the future to understand the ecosystem as a whole. And I think that is also something that needs to be happening that we, we need to kind of separate ourselves or the interests um, in, a, in a big way uh, to actually understand the ocean as a whole, the ecosystem, population, and particularly the processes. And, and so those examples, I think, are pointing to that, to that way. Great. Um, Anya, I see you've got your hand raised. It wasn't on this point. It was it was about the mechanisms to bring the international uh, community together. So is it? Shall I? Okay. Sure. Does, um, yeah, please. So, so one of the things that um, that that I've been thinking about, and it's something that the Ocean Frontier Institute, my institute, has been working in, is that there are mechanisms already that we can work with and bring into the UN decade in terms of, of how to bring nations together to focus on the big grand challenges. And the Ocean Frontier Institute is doing exactly this. We're working through the G7 right now as we speak with Canada to enact a global ocean carbon observatory to bring that kind of big scale thinking into the net zero carbon policy initiatives, which are going to be important for all our countries with the ocean as an absolutely critically under poorly understood undersampled part of the net zero carbon question. So if you go to talk to government um, or many other policymakers, they absolutely have no idea that most of the carbon anthropogenic carbon has gone into the ocean. That the, with, without understanding the ocean's ability to absorb carbon and the potential trajectory in future, which may have the ocean releasing carbon back into the atmosphere, we can't get to net zero because the baseline will be changing based on ocean dynamics. And so getting them focused on that internationally, and we're starting to initiate these discussions through the G7, um, we believe that we will actually working in the space of bringing the G7 discussion together, we can make traction. Now, I think it's critical that this sort of discussion then become nested under the UN decade so that that process can be taken forward at a, at a much broader global scale than just the G7. So I, I think there's, there's ways to do these targeted, focused, clear-headed international initiatives and get our national governments to come into the discussion. Um, and I think that changes also how uh, both policymakers and philanthropists see the question. Once we have our environment ministers talking that way, um, a lot of people will come into the discussion that might not have been interested before. Interesting. And actually, Anya, just a, a question that I'm going to weave in from the audience uh, pertaining to that, and then Max, I'll come back to. I see your hand raised, but uh, as you've thought about this, 
Do you have any thoughts of what would be the business model for something like that? The question actually is what would be the business model for ocean observation tasks? I think it's I think it's super tricky, but I think it comes down to understanding the base, the data baseline upon which ocean businesses are built. Um, and that if we, you know, very often when I talk to our industry partners, they talk about, well, if I need the data, I'm going to buy it. So I'm not really interested in the public sector so much. But then when you start to have the deeper discussion, many users of ocean data don't realize that they're users of ocean data, and that needs to be mapped very carefully because many industries, it, once they understand the data sources upon which their um, business depends, will become more interested in a public private sector um, linkages and, and coalitions to make sure that those ocean data continue to flow and that they become sustainable. So I think um, that that whole conversation uh, needs a bit of a kind of a, a, a revolution, if you will. Great, thank you. Uh, so Max, I think you had your hand raised. Yeah, there. yeah, shortly. I think one of the other things, and I and I want to highlight the work that you guys have been doing, at Schmidt um, Ocean Institute, and also uh, Rev uh, Ocean. I mean, there's a lot of communications uh, hand to hand too. I think it it's getting more exciting and more sexy. Let's say this, you know, like the science and finding, uh, you know, this species in places that we were, you know, not even thinking that they were not even in our imagination. I think by these groups like, you know, Sea Legacy, Only One and others are bringing together on showing us what is it that we are trying to understand? What are we finding every day? And you guys have been doing a great job on putting this together. I think that is a very key element for people to understand why is it important, or at least to see, you know, what's going on down there. I think that that uh, it's another very key partnership that we should think more often into. Thank you, Max. And I think that ties into, I think Powell said, uh, you know, we're competing uh, or someone said about this against the space and it's exciting to do, uh, to look at the ocean. Um, Justin, I see your hand was raised. Yeah, so this this idea of business models and ocean observing and industry, academia, government, and who pays. I, I, maybe I'm going to repeat myself here a little bit, but I think at the moment the problem is we have this vision of this these data being so very very precious and so very very rare. If instead we look to other areas where data is a business. The reality is a lot of times it's the analytics and the actual utilization of the data that has monetization value less so than the data itself, right? Those of us who participate in social media have been giving our data away and the social media companies have been making money selling advertisers information about us, right? But that's because there's so much of it, right? That data is just prolific. If we can get our heads around by the end of the UN ocean decade, ocean data being as prolific as all these other data types on the planet, we'll worry less about how to pay for the data and more about how to use it wisely. And we'll see both economic and environmental positive impacts out of that future data economy. That's great. And for that, we need the technology and innovation uh, to change, to help change that mindset. Yeah. Um, did you have something else there, Justin? No, just being a cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, uh, Nina, your hand was raised next. Thanks. And I think uh, Justin just hit the nail on the head. Uh, I mean, uh, that's exactly right. And I mean, there is so much ocean data out there already. I mean, there are more than 200 open ocean data portals. Uh, but in addition, there are thousands of databases that remain closed for no particular reason. They're just not being shared. So if we were able to find a good mechanism of making openly available and shareable all the data that already exists and putting it together, merging it in new and meaningful ways, we could make better, more predictive uh, analysis the data would actually have um, more meaning and be more valuable to the owners of the data or those that actually collected it because it can be further uh, built on and uh, developed. And that will, again, uh, fuel more uh, uh, data gathering, uh, collection, uh, merging and analysis going forward. So I think what 
of course needs to happen uh, for that uh, to take place is um, a better system for sharing the data, a trust amongst the different data uh, players, and of course a structure in place that enables uh, the different players to uh, put their uh, data in uh, one particular place. And I know that uh, the C4IR Ocean is trying to do uh, exactly uh, that. So for those of you who haven't checked it out already, I recommend uh, that you do. But uh, there is definitely a huge and valuable potential in taking advantage of the data that already exists. Thank you, Nina. Yes, uh, definitely getting organized. And yeah, please do check out the C4IR4. Um, okay, so I have a lot of raised hands here. So Andrea, you're next on my list here. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, speaking about business models and how we can better work together, I think that it's quite important uh, that uh, we agree on the principles on which uh, we work. So what we try to do in Europe, of course, based on the inspire and fair principle, so data should be collected only once and of course, uh, be kept uh, with the most reasonable uh, uh, cost. Then, of course, when we are speaking about fair principles, it's about findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and re reusable. It's quite important that data is collected only once. And what is happening, looking a little bit of the Europe experience, is that we have different communities, hydrological, meteorological, environmental, scientific, collecting the same data. If we are able, all these communities, to work together and to reduce the cost and not to overlap, it's already a step. Then if we bring, uh, I would say the communities as well together can create a market uh, on uh, uh, related to the technologies that are used for the collect collection of the data. The market could be quite impressive and of course the investments could follow and support this. So uh, this could be, uh, I would say basic principles on the work for the ocean observation bringing people together and try to have data collected only once. Thank you, Andrea. It's a very good point. Uh, Powell, you're next. Yes, I didn't know that within one hour we can solve such a complex problem, but actually we did solve it. So what we just together uh, came up to the conclusion is that we need to take this uh, big, less defined problem divide it into smaller, much more defined problems, which we call missions or grand challenges. And by giving an, uh, uh, an by assigning economical impact to these challenges, we, we actually change this into the uh, inside driven challenge. It's not about data anymore. I'm sure there will be lots of companies and organizations collecting data, but if we could uh, digest this problem into smaller challenges where we could um, um, really define the the question, the question we'd like to have answered, and how much value there is for this answer. So how much how much value this answer could be? Uh, then I really see how this could stimulate the whole uh, industry to find solutions, to find answers to these questions, which at the end are insights. That's a really good perspective as well, uh, Powell. Thank you for saying we've solved the world's problems here. That's great. That's a, that's a good job, <laughs> panel. Very well. <laughs> um, so, um, Vladimir, I see you have your hand raised next. Thank you very much, Jyotik. I was not the first, but, you know, let me take advantage of this, you know, because, you know, we were actually on the data issue. And I would like to give you an example. I would like actually to congratulate Pavel here. And, you know, because of the work of Fugro. Uh, in, in principle, you know, Fugro was one of the first companies that decided to, to start sharing data. And this is a very good example. Uh, so under the decade, uh, we are going to have, uh, well, I'm, I'm probably not supposed to release all the details, but, you know, in principle, there is one big project that is working on mapping 
uh, uh, the ocean, uh, to, de to determine the ocean depth. This is a, a, a project which is funded by Nippon Foundation and uh, a joint venture between the IUC of UNESCO and in the International Hydrographic Organization. This project is called JEPCA. It started in 1903, so it's around 100 and, uh, 118 years old. And the idea was to map the depth of the, depth of the ocean. So before we started the seabed in 2030, we had 5% of the ocean area mapped with appropriate resolution. By sharing the data, we increased this number to 19%. So almost four times. We probably will need another 40, 50 years to, uh, to cover the whole uh, ocean. But you know, in principle, you know, if we invent uh, new technologies, if we start exchanging data, I think it will be possible to first, first uh, for the first time in history, to map the ocean in, in, in the totality. So, you know, by creating such engagement and products, it is uh, uh, possible to uh, stimulate exchange of data. This is what we would really like to do. And, you know, a couple of years ago, when we were still designing the decade working on the implementation plan, it was asked what would be uh, the decade success uh, in terms of data work. And I thought and then responded. So in the, if in the result of the decade, the richness of the products will be such that it will be helping coastal communities and many other uh, players in the ocean to get their, their products tailored, useful. So it will be much more advantageous for them to share data and get the benefit rather than to sit on the data. We will have a successful decade in terms of data. So, and I would like also to, I, I noticed some questions here. There will be soon indeed an announcement of decade programs. You will be amazed by the, um, by the breadth and also, but you know, not only technical character of the, all these projects, this is really, uh, engagement of the whole community uh you know thinking about social issues so i think we're creating a, a good movement and this uh, dis discussion is really helping to solidify it thank you thank you vladimir and um, you talked about something that anya mentioned which is a mission which is the mission to map the seafloor and the impetus that that's created so it's a kind of a proof of that idea there um uh stephanie I see your hand is raised. Yes, I just wanted to make a point uh, on how to leverage and take advantage of the data that's already there. I mean, at least the one that's public. Uh, there are great uh, concrete examples that have uh, come through um, of how to do that in a way that actually excites new profile. We're also talking about that. Uh, different kind of uh, stakeholders. Uh, those are the Agatons, for example. So I know uh, that there are some organized around the world where you know you can come up with a challenge and uh, pools of uh, teams of different background data scientists but also marine biologists uh, business um, oriented people will work together uh, look at what the data uh, what data is available try and organize it and analyze it in order to address a, a specific um, uh, you know challenge and I think we also need to just be innovative in the way that we approach those um, new challenges and just bring on as well different kind of stakeholders and, and try and, and yeah, think uh, outside of the box. Those, those are amazing example, concrete stuff um, that create concrete results as well uh, in a very uh, short time. So it's not the solution for everything, but I think it's a good way to just uh, show people how we can work around data. And I'm not a data scientist, so it's just from from observing, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think there are great things out there that we can get inspired from. Thank you, Stephanie. So um, I think we are actually uh, reaching towards the end of our time here, but I do wanna just wrap this up um, quickly. There are a lot of questions uh, that came in and I think we'll capture those as well as uh, I saw a lot of chat uh, messages popping up, but um, so I just, I want to bring this uh, home really. Um, so there's an old proverb that necessity is the mother of invention. And in this case, uh, there is a, a need in the form of the overarching goal for the ocean decade, which is to get to the science that we need to make our ocean healthy. And underlying that is of course, the necessity of innovation. Uh, uh, and combined with that, as we heard from the panel is the, forethought that goes into the data uh, and the data that that 
technology will produce. Uh, and from that, uh, you know, that necessity for innovation, it's got to be global, it has to emerge from all age groups, um, and it will as the accessibility to technology is becoming easier. This was an amazing uh, panel discussion. Uh, I've been writing furiously throughout, and uh, I'm very glad it's been recorded so that uh, we can go back and uh, really capture the thoughts that were uh, discussed here. Uh, just very briefly, three very, very high level uh, points. First of all, ocean science is about social science and about us. Uh, and as part of that, we have a need uh, to integrate into ocean science for this next decade, diversity. Diversity in terms of regions, uh, globally, uh, indigenous communities, but also diversity in terms of different skill sets and industries uh, to come into this. Uh, the second thing is we need structure and we need to get organized uh, so that everyone knows who uh, is doing what and what their role is in this very complicated system uh, that, uh, that we need to make this ocean decade a success. And that ranges from uh, the data conversation that we've heard uh, about today, um, the principles that we're all working on uh, becoming more efficient. So, for example, um, communities collect uh, very similar data, um, different communities, and, and can we get organized with those outside the ocean community uh, for those who do need that kind of data? And then uh, the third point is about uh, barriers and opportunities. So funding is definitely uh, an issue that we would have to discuss, uh, but also cultural barriers. Uh, so within various types and across various types of sectors, uh, we need a clarity of mission uh, that will really help to create a framework. So what are those key missions that we want to tackle? Um, and then challenges are a perception uh, and many of them uh, they're a perception, not a reality going into this previous decade. I think Powell went through a list of what we perceived as challenges, which have now been knocked uh, out of the water, so to speak. This is an ocean conversation. I can use this pun. Um, uh, and we need to change our mindset, a mindset to become more abundant, um, to, uh, to really... Um, not only become more abundant, but also to, wouldn't it be great to have ubiquitous data, data everywhere, a huge proliferation of data. And then also uh, the need to identify um, the, um, what, what, a, what is an impact? What do we mean by impact and how do we make the business case for funding uh, impact, uh, impactful solutions? So those are just some of the things I was trying to rapidly absorb from this amazing panel. Um, uh, this session was the first to focus on innovation and technology, but certainly not the last. And I want to uh, talk about, you know, we will move beyond business as usual. It is essential to continue these efforts uh, to strengthen this science, technology and innovation interface. So as part of the next steps, um, the Decade Coordination Unit, along with partners, are going to be developing mechanisms through establishment of a working group to further explore existing and potential barriers to developing, investing in, and or adopting marine innovation and technology, and identifying emerging opportunities and creating those enabling conditions that we need that are necessary to support and accelerate uptake globally. Um, this important uh, discussion that we've had here is going to inform that uh, and it will also help to inform designs for future calls for a decade actions, uh, community of practices, as well as um, the development of programs and projects. And so this has been a priceless conversation from that perspective. Um, the recording of this session, as I mentioned at the start, is going to be available on the Ocean Decade website, and you can, you'll be receiving those emails uh, in detail, uh, by email, those details. I want to end by thanking our speakers and panelists. Uh, your contribution and enthusiasm really speaks to the importance of innovation and technology and this nexus uh, that's needed for solutions. 
uh, and has, uh, you know, is required to lay the groundwork for equitable and sustainable ocean economic development under this changing climate. And I want to thank the audience uh, for joining us. It's been, there were so many questions uh, that uh, we will capture them all and, uh, and look at them carefully. Uh, but for also raising those questions and for challenging us to reflect on those. And so I really appreciate all of that. And with that, I think uh, we are at time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.